Simon. Thank you. Et, et uh, je peux parler en français, mais on avait dit uh, plutôt en anglais. In any case, uh, slides are in, in, in English. So, well, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, um, it, um, there are clearly lots of overlap in my interests and the interests of people here. And I'm looking forward this afternoon, by the way. I'm here all afternoon, and I'd be happy to talk to anybody who would like to talk to me about what they're doing, because it's all very good, me talking about what I do, but actually I'm here also to find out about what interests you. So, um, interesting, ah, yes, okay. So here's the overview. I, I'm, I'm actually gonna be talking about comparing brain, brains and artificial systems and the question of what makes systems intelligent. We've just seen a beautiful demonstration of how chat GPT can get it wrong. Um, uh, but nevertheless, it's, things are moving very fast. And I would say that sort of high level vision, which has been my main area of research, I think has been pretty much solved in the sense that, you know, uh, there are artificial systems that can recognize scenes and things like this better than humans can. We've also got these large language models like GPT-4 that some would say are getting close to AGI, artificial general intelligence. Uh, I'll, I'll mention this. But there are two major problems with this sort of artificial stuff is one is the energetic cost of running these things. Because uh, as I'll show you, if you want to actually just simulate the entire human brain using the ways that we're supposed to believe, you know, the, that you find in deep neural networks, you would need about 20 megawatts. Whereas the brain only uses 20 watts. So it's a million times more efficient than what we're being sold at the moment. <clears throat> The second thing is that learning is really slow. It takes, you know, you know, hundreds of years of GPU time to, to learn all these language models. And, uh, and that also is extremely power uh, expensive and nothing like humans, because we learn things in, as I'll try and convince you, in two to, two to five repetitions of almost anything, meaning there's noise. If it repeats, you learn it. That's not what you find in these artificial systems. And I think it's something that's missing. And I'm going to also argue that spike-based computing, which has been my ob obsession for, for a long time now, is actually a solution to both challenges. So I'm going to uh, uh, talk to the re recent stuff we've been doing, simulating literally a billion neurons on a Mac. And you, you'll see these neurons spiking and so on. We haven't quite got the learning going yet, but you know, give me a couple of weeks and should get there. Because we have um, learning rules which are really, <clears throat> really much simpler than the things that people use in backprop and all the rest of it. Binary connections, much easier to handle, and weight swapping. Now, I don't know whether that's actually biologically plausible or not, but it works. And maybe it's something that the, the brain could use. <clears throat> And our, our first application area within the next few weeks is going to be uh, seeing if we can get these, these billion neuron systems that can learn to learn language. So this is you know, obviously extremely relevant to what people are doing here. We're going to be pumping in sort of uh, sequences of ASCII strings and seeing what the system will learn. Um, a lot of this is related to stuff that was in my ERC grant, I mean, uh, where I made, as I usually do, 10 provocative claims and, and see, actually, I think all, most of these are uh, viable, including things like, you only need binary weights. Um, we've got grandmother cells, so there are people here who may uh, be uh, okay with that, but a lot of people don't like grandmother cells. For me, this is fine. Anyway, I won't go into the details of that. What I will do is just make a few comparisons between the brain with its 86 billion neurons, 16 billion of them in the cortex, maybe 4 billion in the visual system, a sort of clock speed of one kilohertz in the sense that spikes last about a millisecond. So you can't, you literally can't have more than that. And actually, you know, real neurons, if they fire above 100 spikes per second, it's extremely un un unusual. Really slow collection, conduction velocities, that's a, that's a real killer problem. So one or two meters per second for getting from here to here, that's going to slow down the brain enormously. But as I already mentioned, 20 watts, that's, 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 the, that's the, the, the ultimate objective. If you've, got a, uh, if you've got lots of money, you can go out and buy yourself. Well, you actually, not yet. I think you have to wait another few months. But NVIDIA have got this new uh, H100 tensor core GPU. It's got 
80 billion transistors, same number as neurons of the brain, uh, it will do nearly a, a, a thousand teraflops of uh, that's floating point operations a second, massive memory bus, use about 700 watts, which is a lot, you know, it's, it's a lot less than you would have needed not long ago. Costs, I think, about $33,000. So if you if you want to get one, you have to get put your grant applications right now. Right now. How do these compare? Well, firstly, on vision, things like object and scene processing, and also language, understanding and generating set text. These are both areas where we can compare the performance of the two. So just a, a quick, very, very, uh, what I've been working on for most of my career is fast visual processing, which basically started with Molly Potter. We were talking about this. Uh, Arthur Jacob told, told me about the, this was the, the first person to use real images, I think, pretty much. And she was she showed at 10 frames per second. These are pictures of animals. Uh, and basically, you see them all, even if you, you know, if I said there were 30 of them, tell me how which animals were shown, you wouldn't be able to remember, but you, you know, you, your visual system seems to do the work. Um, <clears throat> but if I, if I, this is a, something that I do, in, I've been doing in my talks for the last 20 years, so you may have seen this already, but if I insert a, 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 an odd man out in, in a sequence of animal pictures and ask you to spot it, uh, here you go, did anybody not see the Mona Lisa? Uh, it's, it's pretty reliable. Uh, here's another one. Did you all see the Statue of Liberty? No. Not necessarily. Oh, well, don't worry too much. <laughs> not, the end, not the end of the world. And, and one last one, did, did Mickey Mouse. So Mickey Mouse is an animal, but it's sufficiently unlike the other animals that you notice it. Now you could say, oh, you only, you only actually process the ones that, you, that jumped out at you. But no, you have to process every one of them. And it's because they're all animals that they sort of, in the same category, um, they sort of cancel each other out. Like, oh, more animals. Even if I don't tell you that they're all animals. Yeah, the question at the back there. Um, no. Uh, yes, sorry. Yes, absolutely. Yes, I, I, did, I told you that there were going to be animals with an odd man out, but the Mona Lisa is what you'll remember whether I tell you or not. Anyway, um, I mean, for me, this is all activating visual memories. And I sort of imagine that we've got, you know, hundreds of thousands of things that we've stored. And the question is, I've been interested in how does the brain do it? And can we build artificial systems that can do the same thing? We get a lot of cues, clues from the speed with which we can do this. And that's why that, that speed of processing paper, I think, really had quite an impact because we can use um, anatomical and physiological constraints without uh, T's missing. But basically, this is a this is a sort of summary in the monkey visual system, you, image comes in and you go through a whole layer, load of areas. Um, uh, and you get to these neurons at the top end of the visual system in about 80 to 100 milliseconds, and you get face selective cells and various other things at that sort of level. And because of the conduction delays, this almost certainly has to be feed forward processing. There's no time to go back and check on anything. The system decides that there's an animal present with a few milliseconds per processing step, maybe probably only one spike per neuron, very sparse coding. And you know, you could say, well, can you do that with an artificial system? And that's where the image neck challenge comes in. This was developed by Fei Fei Li and her and collaborators in the uh, in the early 2000s they, they had a collection of millions of images uh, belonging to the different categories and the task was train up your system and then you get a test where you have a, images with one of uh, a thousand possible categories and and your system has to say which which matches with natural images and i was actually at the European Conference on Com Computer Vision in, in Florence uh, in 2012 with Yann Lecun, actually. Uh, and the place was buzzing because uh, the, the state of the art in computer vision had just been demolished by Jeff Hinton and his two students with what's now become known as uh, uh, AlexNet. And this paper has been cited over 129,000 times, just uh, it's one of the most significant papers in the history of anything, I think, probably. And they had the most stupid, dumb neural network with an image comes in, seven layers of, uh, of neurons, 
convolutional neural layers and then fully connected layers and then you have a thousand neurons in the output layer which correspond to the categories they give all the details they tell you how many neurons are they show you the the um the uh, features in the first layer you can also look at the what features are learnt in layer later layers, but it works basically. Six hundred fifty thousand neurons, lots of millions of parameters, hundreds of millions of synapses, and um, well, in when that came out, this is AlexNet in uh, the end of twenty twenty one. It was getting this is the top five accuracy. The year after, a very courageous guy at Stanford spent all summer trying to learn. Uh, all the 57 breeds of dog that are in ImageNet. Um, and he got to 94% you know, correct. He said, yeah, humans are better than machines. And then the next year, the, you know, uh, he was overtaken. And now we're at 99.5% correct with these with this machine things. So humans are sorry, we're not competitive. We, we're out uh, done in particular. Because, you know, you saw, if, if, if I asked you to name a picture of, you know, one of those things I flashed up, it'd probably take you about half a second, because it takes actually quite a long time for the brain to sort of find the right word and everything. This is all something, things that you know about. Um, uh, ImageNet, so about two, two images a second you could name if you were going really fast. Uh, GPUs can do 16,000 of these a second. And the reason is simply that, you know, our, our, our neurons send information around at about one meter per second. And so most of our 500 millisecond delay for getting, uh, it's, uh, you know, um, Leonardo DiCaprio or whatever the picture was, most of that's conduction delays. Um, whereas in a GPU, the transmission is almost at the speed of light. So we, there's no way we're going to compete with these systems. Um, and the other problem, which is, and lots of people here are interested in, well, we can't process images in parallel. We've got phobias. You know, we're, we're, we have to look at things in order to, to, to get enough resolution to recognize them. And we make, you know, up to five Ks a second. And you obviously need this to read because you need high resolution. Um, but we've known for some time that in, uh, these computer systems can pro process images in parallel in, uh, without any attention at all. In fact, this is an image from uh, uh, back in 1999, Arno Delorme, and I'll mention him. We did a, a, a simulation, spiking neuron simulation of visual processing, which would got 97% correct in saying which of 40 different individuals was present everywhere in this image. The, 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 the green rectangles are where it correctly said which of 40 different people are. There are seven errors. This was in 1999. It took 30 minutes to do that in 1999. A couple of years later, when we'd set up spike that technology, it took a, a less than a second. And today I'm doing this um, with colleagues in, in Holland on a, an FPGA, it takes a couple of milliseconds to do the entire image. So you can do a full 4K image and find everything that's bigger than about 30, 30 pixels across and count them and everything in one shot in a couple of milliseconds. We have no hope of competing with these. But basically, you know, you know, how many jobs, you know, why are we still paying people in airports to, to inspect baggage? I mean, uh, I haven't the foggiest idea. I mean, it's definitely you can automate that, and people don't fall. And the artificial systems don't fall asleep. What about other aspects of human cognition? Well, if you've been following the news recently, it, everybody is talking about these new systems, the Chat, chat GBT and the more recent things. This 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 guy actually um, is. I've been following him in the last few weeks. I'll be just, you know, every day there's something coming out. He gives a new, you know, 12 minute thing on, you know, um, uh, the GPT bomb bombshell. This is the one I want to talk about. Sparks of artificial general intelligence. This paper published by the guys at Microsoft, where they say GPT-4 can solve novel and difficult tasks that span mathematics, coding, vision, medicine, law, psychology, and more without needing any special prompting. Uh, and, uh, and in these tasks, GPT-4's performance is strikingly close to human level performance. There are other people you know, elsewhere in this guy says, you know, uh, the IQ of these systems is at least 114. So that's better than 85% uh, of humans. And it's going like that. I think, um, you know, uh, so Bill Gates 
um, had a thing like this last week. You know, he was saying he was he was he was amazed uh, uh, that GPT was able to uh, do a, 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 a difficult uh, exam at 99 percent which is you know better than humans can normally do he was, he was amazed by that and then there's this 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 um, this thing in forbes uh, some there's some mad neuroscientist thinks that super intelligence may be closer than we think maybe by the end of this year that was in october last year i'm beginning to think that maybe i wasn't so mad at all in in suggesting that this because it's we're on this sort of massive acceleration and, and, and there's so much money being thrown at this by google and microsoft and you know, Facebook and, and, and open AI and so on that you know this isn't going to stop but let's say that you know, so this is moving very very fast and the question of you know can we get human level intelligence have we captured what it takes to do uh, to produce intelligence you might think that we're getting there but there are a couple of problems and I want to talk about that now one is the fact that these systems are hor horrifically expensive in terms of energy compared to the human brain and the other is the way it learns. So firstly, the, the energy problem. Um, you know, we have 86 billion neurons in the brain. Let's assume that you know, on average, they get about 7,000 synapses. And let's suppose that we wanted to use an artificial neural net as they're currently done, recalculating the state of every one of those neurons every millisecond. You would need 600 petaflops and the most well this is wrong actually uh, because the most powerful computer in the world now is an exascale computer but last year it was the, the fugaku super computer which uses which can has enough power but it's using 30 megawatts of power so the latest one which is in um uh, uh, it's an exascale computer that's just opened recently. It's using 20, 20 megawatts. Okay, but you're still we're talking about a million times more power than the brain. So what's the what's the what's the secret? How does the brain get away with it? Well, for me, the the key thing is that these all these neural networks are trained um, using uh, representations using floating point numbers. You have floating point numbers for the neuronal activation levels, if you want to talk about neurons, and for the connection strength. These things have got you know, billions of parameters, and these are very expensive to do. Now, we know that real neurons use spike spikes, and you should say, well, is that a problem? And if you talk to people in, you know, the, the, the director of, uh, of NVIDIA, for instance, he says, well, spikes are stupid. I mean, we can send a, a floating point number with, you know, 32 bits with as much precision you want. If you wanted to use a, the firing rate of spiking neurons even to get eight bits you need to wait for 256 spikes and he says well that's going to take a couple of seconds therefore spikes are stupid uh, and, and and he was saying this you know literally um uh, uh, not long ago but that's wrong because uh, uh, um, we do have to worry about how spikes do it Firstly, floating point mass is a disaster, very expensive. Rate coding is a disaster, and that's something that not everybody knows. Backprop learning is a disaster. And I think the, you know, the solution is to think about how, brain, how neurons code information. Essentially, classic neural networks have, if you've got 16 neurons here and 16 synapses onto this neuron, it's as if the, the neurons each, have each got a floating point number for the activation level, then you've got a floating point number for the weight, you multiply the things together, you get and you add all everything together, and then you feed that through uh, some sigmoidal or uh, rectifying linear function to get the output. This, that's for one neuron, and it's only got 16 synapses. So when you've got a neuron and it's got 7,000 synapses, the, the, it's astronomically expensive to calculate. So, you know, and this, this, this is sort of understandable because if you're an engineer and you go and talk to a neurophysiologist and you say, yeah, neurons produce spikes, how, what's the code? And they'll say, oh, it's the firing rate. Most people believe that. There are, I won't go into the, bore you with the details. There are lots of ways that you could use spikes to code a, a, the, the firing rate. Uh, but uh, the bottom line is they're all, they're all terrible in terms of efficiency because there's an alternative which is way, way more sensible, which is to use one spike per neuron and look at the order in which they fire, because basically um, you can use a wave of spikes 
if you imagine in the retin, the retinal ganglion cells um, have a threshold. When you give it a weak stimulus, it takes a certain time to get threshold. Increase the intensity, it fires earlier. And so you get this sort of intensity latency function as intensity of the stimulus will actually contrast if you're talking about you know, retinal ganglion cells and the, the latency drops off. Uh, so seen that way, the sensory neurons are essentially intensity to delay converters and not intensity to rate converters, even though, you know, uh, if you leave the thing running, it will generate a rate. But the amazing thing is that this has been known since the very first study ever done on the visual system by Lord Edgar Adrian in the, uh, in the 1920s in Cambridge. He got the Nobel Prize for this. This is his paper from 1927, Action of Light on the Eye. He was, had this clever system that, me that measured, he sort of dissected away the optic nerve in the eel and was measuring the had a, a sort of device that measured the, the rate of pulses uh, being generated. It wasn't, it wasn't an individual neuron, it was a bunch of them, I don't know quite how many. And then he just he had he shone a light on uh, the, the retina with two intensities. And you can see high intensity, low intensity. This is the frequency of spikes in this dissected away bit of op optic nerve. And you can see that with the higher intensity stimulus, you get a higher firing rate. Yeah. You also have a higher maintained firing rate. Yeah. And then you look at the latency and you can see, see the latency is half with the higher intensity than, that, than the stronger intensity. The very first paper on the neurophysiology and everybody talks about rate coding and not about the use of the, the when the first spikes arrive. The retina is an intensity to delay converter. And that basic fact was ignored, I think, you know, literally for several decades and uh, which is a shame because you can actually do lots of processing with just the first spike if you look at when they fire and so you got here we got 16 neurons and we got different intensity values they could be coding anything you like they will tend to fire a bunch of spikes that come out asynchronously and even when uh, there's one spike per neuron in other words the firing rate is equal for everybody you can tell a huge number of things um, uh, so, for, for instance, you get this sequence of spikes here, and uh, we were talking about, you know, with 16 neurons, the number of orders that are possible is 21 trillion with 16 inputs. I mean, it's a massively rich space, so you can tell all sorts of different patterns from this. And um, um, we don't, we, at one point in the 90s, um, we thought that the, the actual ordering was being used, but it, it's actually massive overkill. Now we think it's much simpler. You can, you can add in a little relay circuit. Um, for instance, if this, is, if this is the retina, retinal ganglion cells, and this is the lateral geniculate nuclear, you have, nucleus, you have one relay cell for every fiber coming from the retina, and you have lots of inhibitory circuits which can be doing what I call a, a temporal winner-take-all um, uh, thing, such that um, uh, you flash something on the retina, neurons in the retinal ganglion, ganglion cells fire, and then in the lateral geniculate, you have this circuit that will only let a certain number of uh, cells fire because as soon when it gets to four, it inhibits everybody. Uh, uh, and so, this picks off, oh, by the way, you, didn't, you don't even need the relay cells. You could do this directly on the, in the retina if you wanted to. That would be even cheaper because here, the inhibition will block, um, uh, you flash something on the retina and only the first four retinal ganglion cells get to fire at all. That you've just, you've just reduced the power consumption of your device by a lot, depending on how you set the, the inhibition. Um, New idea, first time ever mentioned it, but it's what we're working on now. I think the oscillations, which you find all over the place, could be doing this not because I was talking there about flashing images on the retina, but within the, in the, in, within the brain, you don't have a sort of an onset. But what you could do is to use oscillations so that here, um, imagine that you've got your 16 neurons, could be anywhere in the brain, the hippocampus or whatever, and you've got some excitatory um, drive, which is pushing the neurons gradually up, uh, uh, ramping them up, and letting them fire in order. 
And so um, as, the, as this excitatory drive increases, the neurons will end up firing and the order in which they fire is telling you which ones were the most excited. And then if you add in the same inhibitory reset circuit, you can make it so that on, during each oscillation, you only get N spikes, right? So here, you only get four spikes. And so um, one of the nice things about this is it, it doesn't care what the actual levels are. So you can have activity in, in the visual cortex or the hippocampus, wherever you like. And by doing this oscillation thing, pushing the neurons up, and then just when you get the number of neurons to a spike that you want, then you reset everything and then do it again. And you can do this, you know, in the visual cortex, you've got these gamma frequency oscillations that are out, that can go about 60 hertz. Actually, the oscillation frequency, interestingly, depends on the, the intensity, the higher intensity of the stimulus. If, you have, if you've got a grating, which is high contrast, the, the oscillation frequency is higher. You lower the contrast and it's slower. It's exactly what you'd expect. It takes longer to get the, the neurons you want over threshold. So in other words, you, you'd have this sort of thing where on each oscillation, you have a packet of spikes going through here. They're all the same. But if, if you were you, if, if, if you're coding different things on every cycle, you could do the N of M trick. So you just re reduce the number of spikes you need and you know which are the highest values. You don't actually care what their absolute values are. I don't I don't care what the you know what the actual level of gray here is what I want to know is which are the most important ones and that you can read out very quickly with spikes and so on so let me just go back Arno Delorme I've already mentioned this this is actually back in 1999 he, he made the first his first version of SpikeNet, which is a, a simulator that essentially takes you take a large population of neurons and you say um, a, a subset of them are fire a spike, and so you have a list of the neurons that spike. You then propagate those spikes to the target, and then you look, you look to see whether the neurons have gone over threshold. And this actually works uh, really well. And in fact, Arno's code, uh, which he wrote during his thesis in the late 90s, you can still download it untouched, and it runs today, which I think is, is pretty good. I mean, most of the things I had from then are on floppy disks. You can't, I can't read anymore and, and all the rest of it. But you can download his code, and it still works. Um, and we joked back in the late 90s that SpikeNet, this version of SpikeNet, could be used to stimulate the entire human brain in real time, as long as the neuron, uh, no neurons fire any spikes. Because basically, if no neuron spike, there's, there's nothing to do. You, uh, as soon as one neuron fires a spike, then you propagate to see what happens. If a, if a thousand neurons fire a spike, you propagate a thousand spikes and so on. And, and so that's what we're doing now. Um, so Pierre Kukel, who was a, a master student at the IRIT, he was doing this on a, you know, the latest, not the, not the H100 GPU from NVIDIA. This was a, you know, what the, the best we could get a couple of years ago. He was doing a billion neurons, uh, propagating a, a million spikes in 18 milliseconds, doing effectively what Arno did back in 1999, but just with better hardware. So he was doing two billion updates a second. Uh, and more recently, I've got two students, um, Aditya Kar, who's now doing a PhD with me, and an, and an M2 student. And we're doing uh, effectively the same thing on a MacBook Air. So this has got... Uh, uh, you can buy these at the FNAC and Darty and all the rest of it. They've got 24 gigabytes of memory on the chip, uh, which is can be used directly by the CPUs and the GPU cores and everything. Anyway, don't worry about that. Got, it's got two terabytes of solid state disk uh, and so on. And it's only using 39 watts. Now, it's slower than the NVIDIA fancy thing, but it's, you know, it's running on stuff that you can have on your desk, you know. So it's essentially SpikeNet from uh, version 19, 20, uh, 2023 rather than 1999. And it's just incredibly efficient to do things this way. It only uses binary weights. So no, no floating point numbers at all. No floating point calculations. And um, this is actually sent to me overnight. Um, this, is, um, this is actually, a, I think it's a billion neurons. Each has got 64 connections. and we propagating a packet of spikes um, and then we're calculating the 
the histogram of their activation levels to pick off the, uh, the, 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 the most active ones. It's the, the equivalent of doing an oscillation, but a darn sight cheaper. We've got a billion neurons. If you actually wanted to push up the billion neurons gradually until a thousand of them fire, that would be horrifically expensive. All we do, we propagate the spikes, look at the, you know, the distribution of the activity and uh, uh, pick off the, the, the thousand the best. And those are the spikes for the next cycle. And you, sorry, yeah. Can you clarify what you call the activation of a neuron? Floating no, it's a, it's it's a, it's a, uh, an eight bit. Uh, it's a byte. So the, the the activation can be between zero and two hundred fifty six, two hundred fifty five, but actually most of the time we're down at very low values unless the connectivity is anything other. This is just random connections um, that we're we're simulating here you can sort of see you can see that actually uh, you can see the neurons firing here but it's you know it's it's going you know every frame you've got a new bunch of neurons basically um so this is this is like oscillations but it's a big cheat basically you know we're not actually doing oscillations but it's doing the same thing picking off the n most excited cells out of a million out of a billion so we've just increased the the efficiency by a factor of a, a million well, that's interesting. That's the number I was trying to do. Rather than 20 megawatts, I'm using 39 watts on my Mac. And the reason is we only propagate neurons, spikes from neurons that fire. And the smaller, the more you reduce the number of neurons that fire, the better it works. Now, the question is, can you do anything interesting with that? Well, that's, um, oh, by the way, you know, uh, the next, Next thing is real soon now. You know, I've got enough money, I'll buy myself a, a, one of the new MacBook Pros when it comes out with 96 gigabytes. Or the next chips are going to have apparently 384 gigabytes of memory on the chip. Right now, that's going to be big enough to do the entire neocortex. So, um, so basically, just to summarize that. You know, we're moving from this is conventional processing with floating point numbers, a disaster. You can make that somewhat better by having spikes and floating point numbers for the weights, but it's still not great. You can then go to event driven spike processing with binary synapses, which is one thing that we're doing. And then, then you go the whole way and say, I'm only going to use N spikes out of M, and then you're really into uh, low power. Okay, that's the uh, energy issue what about learning so i, I was complaining these uh, you know the you know, G, G, gpt4 thing there's um, hundreds of years of gpu training with massive data sets and so on you know there's no way that children when they're learning to to, to understand speech can have millions of cycles of learning it just doesn't happen like that um, so it works but it's totally unbiological because humans will uh, spontaneously learn to re recognize uh, patterns that repeat uh, in a few trials and with no supervision. And it even works if you're giving patterns of totally meaningless noise. Uh, and um, um, this was, we showed this with Daniel Pesnitz and Trevor Agus, uh, this is back in 2010, where we did an experiment where people were played one second of random Gaussian noise, and the task was horrible. You have to say whether the first and the second half are the same. So here are some examples. I hope the sound will work. Trial one, this is one second where the first and the second halves are different. It's just completely random. All right. uh, the next trial, actually, you're supposed to say yes, because the first and the second half are the same. Same thing here and this one, but not this one. This one's a repeat. That one's not a repeat. And you're saying, this guy is completely mad. They're all exactly the same. But let me just take the, the, the reference repeated noise, and I'll play it 10 times, and listen carefully. You hear that sort of cyclical thing? Actually, that was discovered in 1963 by Bela Yulesh called frozen noise. If you take any noise pattern and you repeat it, you can pick up the fact that it's cyclical within a few cycles. That is a pretty amazing thing. And um, 
And, and what we showed, which was new, is that if you take people who have been trained on a particular set of sounds, send them away for three weeks, they come back in into the lab. On the very first trial, they're way above chance. In other words, they've actually stored a memory for that apparently meaningless noise. You can't imagine they go home and sort of uh, and sort of dream about that noise. There's no, I mean, the amount of information in a, in that file, it's a 44 kilohertz sound sample where on every every sound sample is a random number i mean you know it's just a, a phenomenal amount of information but the brain has stored it and in this other paper which unfortunately i wasn't a co-author on and which um was actually this is data in the supplementary material because it seemed so weird they were recording uh, eight minutes i think it was of shh, and the task for the subject was uh, press a button if the amplitude changes so they weren't doing any tasks, but they were recording ERPs at the same time. And without the subjects knowing, they actually had little 200 millisecond long snippets that got repeated. <laughs> Either a standard thing, which was every time it was uh, the same things, or these blue ones are a new, uh, new snippet. In other words, you're playing this, this random noise you pick a 200 millisecond long thing and then you sort of paste it in five times. And this is the ERP to the first presentation, averaged across lots of trials, second, third, fourth, and fifth. By the time you got to the fifth repeat, you got a full blown auditory evoke potential, which is involving you know huge numbers of neurons, presumably. And the amazing thing is that not everybody noticed that anything was going on their brains did you could pick it up on the erp but some people said oh yeah it was interesting i, I heard a thing going sh 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 like that and other people didn't so the brain does this automatically um we've done something roughly equivalent with in visual memory um we had we developed a, a, an ipad app that that, that where we're using images they will call it brain swatting. Unfortunately, you used to be able to download this, but the, the, uh, the latest version of iOS uh, it doesn't work with this and I have to re redo all the code or something. Anyway, the idea is we present images in a sequence at different frame rates, different numbers of repetitions, different numbers of distractors between the targets and makes lots of conditions. Uh, but this is what it feels like. This is, uh, you, you get a, a sequence of images and your task is to say, is there an image that repeats? And then you get shown four images and you have to pick the one, it was the drum in that case. Uh, and then you get a new drum around, and this, will be, this one is going to be a bit, bit faster. And there's this sort of pile of um, things, that one on the left, the repeated. Uh, and, and so it goes on, and it's, it's a good game actually, it's very amusing. Uh, uh, and we go up to some really quite uh, high rates. There was a dog that repeated there. Uh, uh, what's the next one? I can't remember. You see the ship repeating. Okay, you get the idea. Um, I guess maybe one more. That was really fast. There was this thing that sort of, sort of get, gets solid. And that's actually a, a real, I mean, it, it's not really solid because there's always at least one image between the repeats, but very rapidly, it's as if the thing that's repeating becomes sort of more salient. Anyway, so, um, oops, okay, I might as well show this. This was, we had a sort of competition going in the lab. At that point, I was actually six, <laughs> which is not bad for somebody in my age. But this, uh, remember, this, this uh, chance is 25% on this. There are, every time you get four images, you have to choose the one that you think repeated. And people were getting up to 77% correct on, uh, you know, average across everything. Um, and if you look as a function of the frequency of, of the, the refresh rate, which starts at two, two hertz, which is really easy, you saw, you saw one of those. But we go up to 60 hertz. And the amazing thing is, it doesn't, you know, once you get beyond 15 hertz, it doesn't make any difference. It, it's, it's basically flat, that, which is amazing. Uh, uh, that's the effect of changing the number of times that you repeat. Now, actually, I was explaining this to uh, Arno. We had a trick in this experiment, not, this is not published. We had a, a, a trick trial where you see this stream of images, and then you get shown four images. And it turns out that actually one of them has been, well, three of them have never been seen at all before. And then one of them was shown once. So it's actually only the second repetition. And 
people were getting 45% correct. This is for a stream of images they saw a, uh, um, a, couple, a, few, a couple of seconds ago, probably, and now they, they're looking at four images and they say, oh, I don't know, that one, ah, 45% correct. In other words, people are guessing, actually. I mean, they don't think they're getting this right. And when you tell them, hey, actually, yeah, it was, uh, that, but you'd only seen it once. That's pretty amazing. Anyway, so um, we've done that a bit more scientifically, and that has been published with uh, Evelina Tunel in an even more horrific experiment where actually people got uh, thousands of images, about a thousand images, within which there were actually 18 different images that got repeated. And then uh, in the memory task, you get shown four images, uh, sets of four images, 18 times, and your job is to pick out the, the, the one. And then, you know, you might be shown this one and tested right at the end. This, this actually takes quite a long time to do. So we're talking about several minutes you know, by the time you've done all this. And uh, basically, it's the same thing here. Only here we've gone out to 120 hertz, and we're still getting, you know, 45% correct. Now, I don't know if you can imagine what 120 hertz looks like. It's, it's a blur. I mean, you literally can hardly make anything out at all. And yet people, when you show them four images, one of, one of which has been seen four or five times, and the other ones have been seen so, uh, so you, that means you're flashing an image, the visual cortex has eight milliseconds before another image comes in to store something about that image, and then you, when it gets shown later on, it somehow manages to, to spot that. We've done it with audio stimuli as well. This is Manuel Mercier, who's actually, he got a, he's, got a, he's an engineer in, in, uh, <laughs> in Victor Gers's lab. If you see him, remind him he must publish this data at some point. Um, uh, we did it, so basically this was little clips of sound from my music collection, and we play them uh, as in the RSVP thing. So this would, you, you get something like this. <laughs> You were trying to spot something to repeat. Now I don't know whether some you then get a actually choose a choice of four sounds. There was this one. Would anybody like to guess whether A or B was repeated? In fact, it was A. Let, 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 let me be, let, let me just play you that again. You you probably hear it now. Clack, clack, clack. Did you hear this sort of clack 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 thing? Anyway, the the simple fact is that it it really does work, and it's. You know, with 50 millisecond long snippets, that's 20 snippets a second, if you get, you know, four or six repeats, um, uh, people are doing way above chance, chances, you know, 25%. So it works for other types of stimuli as well. Right. Okay. How does, how does the brain do this? Well, I think um, it's something to do with STDP, um, and, and lots of people have been interested in that's the idea that you know, a, a, an, an input that fires just before a neuron fires gets reinforced, it's a head learning type thing, if it fires afterwards, uh, it, uh, it gets depressed, and um, actually this is, uh, this is from uh, 2007, Tim Maskelia showed that if you've got, this is a model where we have Two, actually 2,000 afferents generating random activity, and then you sort of select a subset at random, the red spikes, and you copy paste them, uh, and you feed that into one neuron, that neuron will, within a few dozens of trials, become selective. The, the gray bit is where the repeating spikes are occurring. So initially the neuron is firing all the time, uh, but because when it fires during the pattern, you're reinforcing inputs which were just active, it will tend to fire more, it'll be more likely to fire to the same thing again. And so within a few seconds, you're here, and with, if you wait a few minutes, it's, it's actually got to the very beginning of those red spikes. And Tim also showed, uh, this is another thing that he did, this is, um, sorry, uh, uh, this is, Taking a sort of uh, sort of image net type, uh, sort of, um, uh, Alex net type architecture, and flashing up images from the Caltech face database, 
we've got three types of neurons, red, green, and blue. Initially, they're all randomly connected, but progressively, they're sort of tending to, because they, they tend to fire, if they fire when there's a bit of face there, they'll be more likely to fire to another face. And so by the time, you know, we're out, uh, we've got, had about 90 presentations, and you can see these, these neurons are becoming selective to face features. Not because anybody says learn faces, it's just simply because the, the, the input contains lots of faces. And we did the same thing with motorcycles, and it learns motorcycles. Um, so basically, STDP rules are like, uh, like that can allow neurons to become selective to things that repeat, whether it's uh, you know random uh, inputs from, uh, from neurons or actual visual inputs for, for the face selectivity thing. But I've just shown you that actually in humans, it, it, it's, not, it's not dozens of presentations you need. It, on the second presentation, we're already getting way above chance. So STDP with floating point weights isn't up to it. Um, but we've got a new um, super dumb uh, learning rule, which only uses binary weights, where we don't adjust the weights, we move them around. And we call it JAS because it was developed by Jake, Amir, Simon, and Tim. So it's using temporal coding. And it, well, okay, let's, let's, let's just go back to that N of M thing. And, and we've got, we've got a, um, our neurons firing here. We're going to pick off the top four. And then we've got neurons here which have got different sets of binary weights. And this, in this particular case, uh, it's exactly what the cell wanted because it's hit the the four spikes are aligned with the four weights that it's got. They've all got four weights. Um, this one's got no hits. This has got no hits. This one's got one. Um, and of course, you know, we, uh, each neuron will like a particular pattern. So that's what we'd like to get to. The question is, how can you get a system to learn quickly? Well, let me just show you one other illustration. It's perhaps a bit more, more um, easy to see the, the interest. Here we've got actually 18 inputs, nine, a three by three patch with uh, horizontal or vertical at each point. We're going to pick off the four most salient things, which just happen to look like a face. And so we feed that into our into our network. And this is actually uh, an ACHN detector, which is which corresponds to a face. And you can do the mass and show that actually, if you pick at four spikes out of, at random out of out of eighteen, the probability of hitting all four weights is like 0.03%. 0.03 percent in other words it's very unlikely that this thing will re respond randomly if you if you pick off the four most excited cells if you just let everybody fire then it, all of these cells fire but if you restrict to n the number of cells by doing oscillations or flashing the stimulus whatever then the system is very uh, very sensitive so um the here's the here's the learning rule we actually have two thresholds we have a threshold for spiking let's say four and another threshold which is lower for learning and this neuron here which got two hits is already you know that's 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 more than you'd expect by chance you could say oh well that's interesting um uh, let's activate the learning mechanism what will that do well it will say um you've got two weights which were didn't weren't used how about move, swapping to an activated input. So you take this one and you move it here. And now with the same input, if you repeat, you get three hits. And then you do the same thing again. Uh, you say, I've got, I've got an unused weight. Where can I put it where there's an input? And you move it to here. And, and bingo, you've got a, a system which now, uh, in two trials, has learnt that that's an interesting pattern. Um, uh, and so basically, we think that you know we can have a system which has got you know large numbers of binary weights where um, you know spikes are coming in. Uh, actually, they can be recurrent connections um, as well. And basically, the neurons are just picking up the coincidences, and that allows you to do store knowledge um, in in a, in a very simple way. So if I were you know imagine as your um, question for a champion, which composer born in 1756? Buzz. If you're a, if you know that Mozart was born in 1756, you could do that with a little network which has got here you've got 16 inputs, 16 outputs. If you hit composer birth 1756, then you've got enough activation to make the, the Mozart neuron fire, and that's pretty much 
what humans are really good at. You know, you give them a, a, a few things, you know, which, which composer born in, in Salzburg would also work, as it happens, because I've got another weight here. There are four weights for, for the neuron. And, you know, this could scale up. So, and you can have sensory neurons if you want and motor neurons, but most of the neurons are recurrent. So, um, how about language? So, well, uh, we haven't done this yet, but we've got, uh, I've shown you the thing doing the you know, billion neurons and propagating spikes. We're going to put in the learning thing and we're going to feed in uh, data from this set of data called the pile, which is used for training. It's basically, you know, uh, lots of um, different sources of text. It's you know, just loads of text. So we can feed that into our system. It's got, I think this has got 2.7 billion parameters for a model, which has already been trained on that, but we can do it as well. And so, you know, as a language, if I sort of say, imagine feeding in random ASCII strings with just the 26, the 26 <laughs> lessons plus a space, then this is, you know, you can search for something that means anything in there. And maybe there's something that you can recognize, but in general, you can't. Now, imagine that we had uh, a, neuro, a neural network where you had the, the 20, 27 different letters in five different positions, and you connect, connected up the neurons at random. Let's suppose we had 24 neurons randomly. This, is, this was generated randomly. So uh, neuron number one has a connection from A or L in position one, H and Z in position two, P in position three, and so on. This is just random. This, is, this obviously knows nothing. What we'd like is that after training, the 24 neurons have learned to respond to things which repeat. And you know, I think that's probably going to happen. Um, here, here, this is doing the same thing with the complete ASCII set of print, not, not the one, not the accents, just the uh, printable characters. These are all random. Uh, actually, there's something here that repeats, but you'd have to search for it because Simon repeats. Um, actually, they're not in the same position, so that wouldn't be good enough. It, it'd have to be in, in the right place. So I can imagine doing a sort of RSVP type experiment. This is, you know, uh, this is, this is just random, totally random. Okay. This is going to be not completely random because there's something that repeats. And the question is, would you notice it? Well, I'm going to give a, I'll buy a beer for anybody who spotted which of those four repeated. Anybody want to guess? In fact, it was this one. Whoops, sorry. It was the X2B. No. Which is not, no, it's not that one. This is. There you go. X2B was, was shown twice. There are experiments to do on this sort of thing to see, you know, and we were talking about this, you know, how, how long can you leave between repeats for the system still to be able to notice this sort of thing. But anyway, um, the, the potential is that we you know we've got the billion neurons running, we've got random connections initially, we can put in packets of spikes which come on, uh, correspond to letter strings. And, you know, the, my guess is that, you know, the, the neurons in the system will become selective to bigrams and trigrams and words and, you know, uh, other neurons would then, this is fully recurrent, if there were words that happened to occur in particular sequences, you get other neurons that would pick this sort of thing up. And it would be, I think, a little bit like these, these you know, GPT-4 things, except that it's learning online and doesn't require, you know, hundreds of GPU years of training. So would that be make it intelligent? Um, I don't know. But uh, one of the one of the things I just want to last thing to mention is that there are no anatomical constraints here. So uh, the, the billion neurons, there's no structure whatsoever. It's just all completely random. The inputs are coming in at random. So if this works, sorry Chomsky, basically, because uh, there is there is no there is nothing predefined at all. It's just a completely random set of weights. So it's going to be an interesting <laughs> thing to follow. Um, right. OK. Well, uh, is lack of structure going to stop this from acquiring knowledge about, you know, everything that's in the, this huge database of text? I don't know. So conclusion. So if we compare brains with artificial systems, 
you know, I think it's a fair case to say that high level vision has been solved and these artificial systems are not only more accurate than ours, but they can, they're about, you know, several thousand times more rapid and they can do the entire image at the same time. So basically that's at the end of many jobs. Um, and the large language models like GPT-4 are getting closer to AGI. They can, they can generate text, you know, they can write essays and get better marks than most students on master's questions. I've tried this, you know, I've, I've, I've sent my master's uh, exam questions to chat GPT. You'd get an 18 at least, you know, from me. Uh, the, the two major problems were the, well, the first was this energetic problem because you know if you if you wanted to do it the way they think we should be doing it, it's 20 megawatts basically and the brain only uses 20 but i think i've hopefully pointed out how because the brain uses spikes and can do it in an ultra sparse way you can you we can already get down the, the power consumption low enough that it'll run on a mac and then the, the other question is uh, is very slow learning um because humans can detect almost anything that repeats with between two and five repeats. And that's not at all present in any of these systems. And you know, we've, 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 uh, we're arguing that we can do that sort of thing with a weight swapping STDP where you don't change weights up and down on a floating point scale, you just move them around and try to get them to match. Is that biologically plausible? I don't know, but it's not totally unrooted. But if you imagine a neuron has got several thousand inputs, but it's actually only got 50 that work, and its job is to move the 50 that work around to where things correspond to the inputs that it's interested in, that could, could be what you need. So this is essentially potentially a new type of intelligence, biologically inspired intelligence with spikes and with binary synapses. And with that, I think, you know, we'll, we'll see whether we can get this, this thing running on a Mac or not. Um, and, and certainly, uh, one of the things I should point out, I'm, I don't want to become the next Elon Musk. This is all going to be open source. And if you want to play with it, um, just come and talk to me. And that's it. So...